John Winsler, W-I-N-Z-L-E-R. Great. And where were you living during the flood? I was living in Eureka. And were you married then and did you have children? Yes. How many children did you have? I think by that time I had four children. Okay. And um, where did you work during the flood? Well, I worked for a firm that my father and I had started back in 1951. It was actually called Winsler, Winsler and Kelly by the, in, the, in the 1960s. We'd expanded to that point, but my father and I actually started it as a partnership between the two of us. And um, tell me about some of your experiences during the flood. Just some of my experiences? Well, uh, first of all, I'd tell you that um, the 1964 flood wasn't the first flood we'd had serious problems with here in Humboldt County. The 1955 flood, it was called the Christmas flood of 1955, was a very major flood and at that point in time had been decreed the major flood of history, but it didn't happen to be that. In 1964, the flood came along and really minimized the 1955 flood. However, in 1955, a lot of small communities along the major rivers here in the North Coast got destroyed, like Myers Flat and Stafford and Holmes and uh, Klamath Glen and Klamath up on the Klamath River. They were wiped out during the 1955 flood, so the, the, the 64 flood was, was much worse in that it destroyed our transportation system, so we were totally isolated. But in terms of residential damage, uh, I'm not sure that it was much more than the 1955 flood. Uh, the, the 1964 flood, of course, destroyed almost all the livestock in Humboldt County, like in, in terms of uh, dairy cows in the Arcata Bottom and Lolita Bottom and Ferndale Bottom, but thousands of cows were drowned. But uh, some of my experience was, were kind of as follows. Uh, I was the engineer for the Humboldt Bay Municipal Water District and they had a dam on the Mad River up at Ruth. It's called Matthews Dam. And that dam was built in 1960 and 61. And I was, I, I was not the design engineer, but I was ultimately the engineer for the district. And we'd had some damage up there in a major fall storm in 1962. So when the 1964 storm came along and we had some knowledge that they were gonna be fairly devastating, uh, I and the district manager, a man by the name of Chester Peterson, decided we should get to Ruth and actually make sure the dam was in good shape. Well, the storm had already started and some of the damage had already occurred, particularly in terms of of the roads, there were slides and trees down and this sort of thing, but Mr. Peterson and I took off very early one day morning before the major storm had, had really hit and tried to get to Ruth. And to do that, you have to use Highway 101 down past Fortuna and then take State Route 36 from there all the way up to uh, the Mad River. And it, it's a kind of a circuitous route, but we, we couldn't get any further east than the town of Carlotta, which is probably less than 10 miles from Fort Tuna. So we came back to Eureka and went up the mountain to Neelan, took the Neelan Road, and it go, actually runs into Bridgeville on the Van Dusen River. We could get across the Van Dusen River all right, that bridge was in, and we went on east, and we actually had, had chainsaws, and we had a four-wheel drive pickup with a winch on it, and we actually cut our way as we went because there'd be trees down and other things and we finally got as far as Dinsmore. And Dinsmore is a little community at that time on the Van Dusen River and we couldn't get any further south or east and it, it nighttime came upon us so we spent the night there and by the way the storm was really moving at that point in time. We spent the night in a bar on a concrete floor in a bar just south of Dinsmore and the next morning uh, we decided we'd better get back to Eureka, which we did. We backtracked almost the same way we'd gone out there. And by that time, there were some real concerns about the stability of Matthew's Dam. And there had been a report telephoned in from the sheriff's office 
in Trinity County that some deputy sheriff who couldn't get to the dam and he was up on South Fork Mountain with binoculars and he thought the dam had breached, it had failed because there was a massive amount of water by that time coming over the spillway. And, and I, I, if you were a long ways away, maybe you couldn't tell. I personally didn't think the dam had breached, but we thought somebody better get out there. And the only way to get out there was, uh, there, there, was there was only one way. You couldn't do it by, by roadway. But the U.S. Navy had moved an aircraft carrier up off the coast of Humboldt Bay, and they had a couple of big Army helicopters on it. I don't know where they were, Hueys or what exactly were. They were the biggest helicopters that we had at that point in time in history. And so I uh, acquired a couple of rolls of cable because my concern was whether the spillway, the only way, in my opinion, the dam could breach was if something plugged the spillway and that something could be a slide above the spillway that came down and, and destroyed one of the walls of the spillway or it could be by blocking of the spillway from debris floating in the reservoir. And so I got a couple of spools of cable and by that point in time, uh, there, there was sort of an organized uh, what did I call it, governmental agency group that was working out of the Ronerville Airport. Uh, they had the California National Guard there and uh, some of the other agencies. And, and the Ronerville Airport was what was being used sort of as the access to Southern California, Southern Humboldt County. Um, and so I went to Ronerville and they told me there would be a, a helicopter there. And there was a helicopter and I loaded my cable on the helicopter and actually was in the helicopter when uh, 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 several vehicles arrived at the airport and they were political figures here in the county, the chairman of the board of supervisors and other, other people who wanted to take a look at the d damage. So when they told me that they were gonna tour around the county for uh, the I shouldn't say county, but the lowlands of, of Ferndale Bottom and everything before they would take me on to Ruth, I objected to it because I thought it was really imperative that I get to Ruth. So uh, they told me another helicopter would be forthcoming within 10 or 15 minutes. So I piled off the helicopter, took my cable off and waited for the next helicopter. And I would just note that the helicopter that I got off crashed and there were a number of deaths in that. Uh, and so maybe it was uh, very fortunate that I did get off. I suppose it was. So when the second helicopter showed up, I put my cable on that and I climbed on the helicopter and there was only one other fellow on the helicopter, an elderly gentleman. I don't know who he was or what he was doing there. And the helicopter took off and headed for Ruth. And the real issue or problem at that time was these pilots who came off of the carrier didn't have the slightest bit of knowledge of the geography or the topography of Humboldt County. They, they had no knowledge of where they were, or where they were going, and it was stormy and the visibility was poor. And uh, so we took off for Ruth and uh, the helicopter had been flying for some minutes, I don't know how long, and I, I finally got up and looked through a little window on the side of the helicopter and I noticed I, I, I'd hunted and, uh, Humboldt County all my life and I was pretty familiar with a lot of different areas and I, and I saw that we were going by Black Lassic, which is a, is a geographic point on our maps and this guy was not even in the right drainage. He wasn't in the Mad River drainage, he was in the Van Dusen River drainage and had far passed, he had passed Ruth Lake and I went up and tapped him on the shoulder and asked him if he knew where he was. and. He, he had a little tiny USGS quad sheet. The, these maps here on my the desk are USGS quad sheets, but it was, he had a much smaller version of that. And I said, where do you think you are? And he showed me, I said, no, you're not anywhere near that. And I showed him where he was and told him how he could get back in the proper drainage and get back to the, the, the dam and reservoir at Ruth. And he, and he did that. And uh, well, when, it, by that time it, it was snowing <laughs> where we were. And, as we came back to the Ruth Reservoir, the Humboldt Bay Water District, who owns that uh, particular dam and reservoir, had acquired an old school building there, and that was kind of a headquarters building for him. And I got the pilot to fly in there, and I, he, he wouldn't get very close to the ground. He was really worried, and when he got close to the ground, the snow would 
come, come up from, from his rotor blades and this sort of thing. So he finally told me I, I was going to have to jump. He'd get down to within 10 or 15 feet and, and I'd have to jump. So I pushed my cable off out of the helicopter and climbed down on a rail and jumped. And actually, I was looking. I, I told him I want to find some soft spot. And there was kind of a mound of snow in, the, in this kind of play yard at this headquarter building. And I thought, I thought it was a mound of snow but it was really a, a mound of Himalaya berries covered by snow. And I don't know if you're acquainted with Himalaya berries, but they're a very thorny berry. And so while I didn't get hurt jumping, I sure got scratched trying to get out of the Himalaya berries. But I got there, uh, I, I found some people that would help me. We, we were able to get from the headquarters down to the dam and uh, the dam had not failed, uh, but there was an immense amount of debris floating on the, on the lake. Later determined to be over 40 acres of debris, as a matter of fact. And what I wanted to do was to check the log boom, which separated the spillway actually from the upper part of the lake. And I, we were able to do that, and it was still safe and sound. And so I didn't have to use a cable. And, you know, in essence, I don't even know how by myself, I could have really done that. We couldn't have put a boat in there to get across. So it was kind of a goofy idea trying to take cable out there to protect the dam. But, but I, I had that experience and I really don't recall how I was able to get from Ruth back to Rohnerville, but somewhere, maybe they had opened the road by that point in time and I did get back to Rohnerville and they were having problems in most of the smaller communities on the Eel and the South Fork Eel, they, they, they had lost power and were unable to pump water. And in particular, Riodel. Riodel was kind of isolated. The, what I'd call the North Riodel Bridge over the Eel River had, had, had gone down. Uh, they were still connected. There's a bridge interconnecting Riodel with Scotia and that was still in place. And Scotia had their own power plant, so I think they were still had power. They did not have a water problem or power problem at, at, at that time. They, they had a massive problem with the loss of logs and lumber. They lost everything in their, in their storage yards. Millions and millions of board feet of finished lumber and millions of board feet of redwood logs, but the town was still in good shape. But in any event, the city of Riodel had lost power and therefore lost their ability to pump water. And they had informed me, I was acquainted with the water system. It was actually at that point in time owned by two brothers. It was a private water system ultimately acquired by the city and it's now a city owned water system. So I had some acquaintance with the system and I was asked if I could get out there and maybe get water into the town and uh, I said, sure, I'll try. And so a little two man helicopter flew me from, from Rohnerville into the t town of Riodel, and I can't even remember where the, we landed, but the guy could land on a dime. He was a real young guy, a real kid, but he knew what he was doing. So he got me into Riodel, and there were three or four domestic fires going, house fires. People would, to keep warm and other things, would do crazy things and start fires in their houses, and, and of course there was no way to fight these fires, so uh, knowing what the water system looked like, I got a hold of a guy who had a backhoe and we went up a road called Monument Road which goes up to a certain area above Riodel and uh, there, was, there was water everywhere. I mean it was raining, there were water in the gutters and the creeks were flooding by that time and so we went up high on Monument Road where I knew the size of the pipe and where it was and we actually just dug a hole in the road and exposed the pipe and broke a hole in the top of the pipe and then went further up and where there was a creek running down through a, a culvert, we diverted that water, dirty water as it was, into the hole in the road and that filled up the pipe system and, and the city of Riodel had water. Now, you wouldn't consider doing that today, but back in those days, you did a lot of things you wouldn't do today. You'd get sued for doing that today by somebody because you were putting dirty water into a, a domestic water system. But, you know, people were, had a lot more sense back in that time. And so what, what we did is we informed all the people they couldn't drink the water. They could use it to flush the toilets and, the, and, the, and they, they fight fire with it. 
and uh, it, but they'd have to filter it through I don't know any anything and, and boil it to, to, to drink. But we took care of their water problem in a matter of a, a few hours where they'd been out of water for several days. And my recollection is that while I was still there working on the system, two guys from the state health department showed up, had nice nice creased khaki pants on and nice overcoats, and they, they just were totally uh, awed by the fact that anybody would do such a t horrible thing as put d dirty water into the water system. But we did, and we stopped the fires, and the people lived through it. But it and, and that was a, sort of the type of thing that went on uh, on a lot of different communities that, that we were able to help. Uh, so we were, we were acquainted with the systems, and we were acquainted with how to do it, how to take care of things like that. So. Oh yeah, and um, if you could uh, look at me when you're when you're talking, right. if you want to make eye contact with Ted, but oh, I think um, okay. it will right. look odd uh, in the video. Uh, all right, <laughs> I'm sorry. They won't know you're behind me, uh, but that's uh, okay. Uh, but it was um, what you're saying reminds me of um, watching what happened after Katrina, Hurricane Katrina, and it seemed like people didn't like there was so much bureaucracy that they didn't know how to act, and it seemed like when I hear stories about them and about what you did. It's like you knew um, what you needed to do in the moment to solve the problem. Um, I'm wondering if you see, if you've seen, if, if when you look at what happened with Katrina, if you think about that, about how different things are now fighting a disaster. Well, yeah, uh, I think it's a whole different world from from when 19, in the 1964 era and what happens today. You have to get a permit for doing anything, and people just really are timid. They're afraid to do things on their own. I wasn't, and still am not, and uh, and, and I found also I, I, we did a lot of storm repair after the 1955 flood. Uh, the county actually retained our firm to manage all of what they called non-FAS road repair in Humboldt County. The county has about 1,300 miles of road, and in that 1955 storm, about 1,100 miles of non-FAS road, some of it was badly damaged, and the, the state had made monies available. Uh, to the county to repair those, and the county selected us to manage it. Now, we didn't have plans that we could use. We'd go out right out there, we'd get loggers right out of the woods who had cats and other equipment. We'd stand there and draw a sketch for them and hand the sketch to them, and, and, and th these guys could do anything. They were innovative, they were, you know, just incredible people, and, and we fixed those roads quickly because people had to, had to move. You had to, uh, had to be able to get to, you know, to stores for <laughs> all sorts of things, but, but it was, today it's a, a permit world. It's not a, not a, a project, <laughs> you know, <laughs> execution world, but uh, yeah, I, it, as far as Katrina, I, I, I do think people just didn't really know what to do, so they didn't do anything. I, I, I do think people here in Humboldt County, uh, at particular, particularly in that era, were capable do, of doing a lot of things to take care of themselves. They didn't have to wait for the government to do it for them. So, yeah. yeah. I was listening to Mary Lou um, Lawrenson. We interviewed her, and she worked at Big Loaf Bakery. And they actually went into production and they made these small loaves of bread that were bundled with some of the stuff that was dropped into some of the areas that didn't have any contact yeah. in. And she even said they did it gratis. I mean, they didn't even charge for it. They just knew yeah. people needed food. No, people people helped everybody. I mean, it was a, it was a joint effort. And uh, I don't know whether that would occur again today, but uh, it certainly it did it in, in both the 64 and 55 floods. People helped each other. And um, did you have family or friends who were affected by the flood as well in different ways? Well, um, uh, I don't know how, quite how to answer that. Uh, I, I, I knew a lot of people. I knew a lot of ranching people that were badly impacted by the flood, lost all their, their livestock herds and this sort of thing. Uh, the 1955 flood had kind of warned them and they'd probably moved their residential existence out of, mostly out of the flood path. There were still a lot of homes within the flood path. And so I, I knew people that were directly impacted that way. I, I also knew people that in the, like in the Redway area, Redway is a, on the South Fork of the Yellow River and, a, and it, it started out as a kind of a summer home area but is transformed into a residential area. 
and there were homes close to the river. That's why you, that's how, how you recreated. You're close to the South Fork River, or South Fork Eel. And a, a number of those homes were badly damaged in, in the 64 flood. I own property down there. I, 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 I had water right up to my doorstep, but it didn't hurt anything really that I owned. And I also am a part owner in a dairy ranch on the Eel River at Fern Bridge. And um, we, uh, we lost uh, several residential units that were attached to the, to the barns and, at that point in time. And we also ended up with uh, probably 10 million board feet of lumber and logs from Pacific Lumber Company. That ended up on our property. And so, uh, but I did, I, I did know a lot of people who, who, who suffered damage, but uh, we're, we're, we're a resilient bunch of people up here, you know. We, that's why you live here. If you're worried about a storm or two, you wouldn't be around here. And when the wood came down onto your property, um, did did the lumber company then were they interested in like getting that back? Oh yes, oh yes, they came and got it, and uh, um, you know, there were lawsuits over whether they could take it. We we as property owners told Pacific Lumber Company, come get your lumber remove it, but you have to put the fields and fences back in shape, which, which they were willing to do, you know, and uh, so uh, that's how that worked. But there, were, there were some lawsuits by people who uh, wanted, to, wanted Pacific Lumber Company to buy the stuff back from them, but that was not us. Okay. Uh, and, um, you know, for people who can't imagine, like I've been through a few small floods here in Humboldt County, but what were kind of like some of the sensory feelings about the flood? What did it like? Did it smell really bad? Did was the um, the sounds really loud? What was it like to be really close to the river at that time? Well, that actually, for several days, everything everything below Highway 101 was water. If you, if you were driving south of, of here, of course when you went up over the hill at Lolita or something like that, but if you were down anywhere near the river, the, 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 everything you, you looked at was just water. You, you saw nothing but water. All of the Ferndale bottoms, all of Lolita bottoms, all of Arcata bottoms, it was just water, that's all. You could see the, the roads mostly were still high enough that you, the roadways got through it, but everything else was water and of course some of that water doesn't make a lot of noise, but if you're close to something like the Eel River that's moving fast, it makes it makes a lot of noise. And it, and there was a lot of wind with these storms, and that that brought down a lot of trees. And as a consequence, you know, the, the, we lost power everywhere. There, here in Eureka, we didn't suffer very much or for very for a very long period of time. But if you were out in the hills, you didn't have you didn't have power for I, I suppose several months and. Uh, but, but again, people may do, they, they could accommodate that. Yeah. How, how do you suppose people found out how the, um, the storm was progressing? If they lost, lost power, did they lose like radio or any way to know? Well, I don't think people had the fancy radios you have today. So yeah, they, they, they actually lost. Um, it, it was a, a kind of a word of mouth thing. Neighbors told neighbors and uh, uh, that, that's really how it how it transpired. I know when I got to Ruth, nobody really knew what was happening anywhere else because they had lost any communication links with anything. And uh, uh, but it, but it was it there was there really wasn't any other way to do it. If if you did have a battery radio or something like that, of course you could pick up radio. And, but uh, the telephone system was down and the power system, uh, but. Word got out, 